Good afternoon. I was about to say good morning. So how many people have been to an ASAP conference before? How many, this is your first one? Wonderful, that's great. So this is, you know, this is a, a really great meeting that I, that I can speak for all of my um, physician colleagues that we really enjoy because we're not talking to ourselves, we're talking to actually why we do what we do to our patients. Um, and, you know, this is such a great meeting and format because there's nowhere else in the world you're gonna get this type of one-on-one -on -one interaction with a bunch of different people with different backgrounds, different opinions, um, to talk about something that's a pretty complex um, problem, which is uh, Chiari. And so I was asked uh, this year to talk about controversies. And I, and I think it's actually, um, to be honest with you, this could be a conference in of itself. Literally, this could be a three-day conference. Um, so and we're going to, let's see here. There we go. So oh, I don't know why it's coming up. This is basically, we're going to do a, I promise, one-minute um, overview of statistics, but in a really basic form. I never did well in statistics ever. Um, but what's important to understand is that we don't just, as, as in medicine, we don't just blindly do things. Um, we have what are called levels of evidence, and there's five levels. One is the highest level. It's, it's a randomized control study that's usually multiple, multiple people, a lot of times are international. That's really where we come up with answers, where you come up with a consistent theme of something that's the right thing to do. That's extremely, extremely rare in medicine. I can probably count on my hand how many things we do, especially in surgery, that have level one evidence. You can go all the way down from level one to level five. And when you get to like three, four, and five, you're really starting to talk about people looking at their own series. You know, hey, I did 100 Chiaris over the last however many years. I'm going to look back and see if there's trends. The bottom one is five, personal observation. You know, I've, I've, I personally have been doing this for over 20 years, and, you know, I have personal observations. It doesn't mean they're right. It means that it's just what I'm seeing. So it's really important to understand that. That's what we use to guide us. And with that, we get recommendations. We use those level of evidence to come up with recommendations. And there, there's class one through three. And one is, yes, this recommendation is indicated. You have these symptoms, you should be offered Chiari surgery. You have these types of features, you should be offered this type of surgery. You know, whether it's opening the door or not opening the door, a lot of these things that are controversies, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, going all the way down to not recommended because there's literally no evidence or conflicting evidence or evidence that goes against something we thought was common sense. Where we are with Chiari um, is really more in, is more in the uh, yellow there. Um, we really don't have any good evidence for a lot of things we do. Um, are we, are we going completely blindly? No, of course not. But we're, we're using these as a guide. Now, the reason that Chiari malformation has so many controversies, this is the poster child of a surgical um, procedure and actually treatment, even if it's medical, that fits into um, really no um, um, clear data evidence um, that is, is, is data-driven. We know certain things work. We, we know, obviously, for a fact that People that have a Chiari malformation based on traditional definitions, and we're going to talk about what those are as well, they do better when they undergo a decompression. But not one surgery is fit for all patients, and not all Chiaris are Chiaris. Um, there's a big push now to get away from the whole term of Chiari malformation and really look at, for Chiari 1, look at Chiari syndrome. Chiari 2, Chiari 3, Chiari 4 is even a lot of controversy if that even exists or is real. Um, you know, those are malformations. Those are anatomic malformations. Chiari is more of a syndrome. Um, so, you know, why the controversy? Why is there so much controversy with Chiari? Um, well, you know, one of the reasons there's a lot of confounding things. And one of the, just starting off with definition, you can ask 10 different people who treat Chiari what the definition of is Chiari. You'll hear five millimeters in adults, three millimeters uh, uh, below. If there's no uh, a herniation of the cerebellar tonsils, it's not a Chiari. You'll hear people who say it's just the symptoms. Is there a syrinx present? Is there obstruction of flow on MRI imaging? So there's really no 100% clear definition of uh, uh, Chiari. We have a pretty good idea, but you know, again, there's a lot of uh, uh, debate uh, amongst uh, uh, caregivers for this. Um, and what confounds it even more is 0.75% of the U.S. populations have a radiographic Chiari. 
So not all those patients are symptomatic and certainly not all those patients need surgery. So when somebody is having migraine headaches that are classic migraine headaches and they happen to have an MRI with five millimeters of cerebellar descent, no other symptoms, you know, where do you, where do you put that patient? Um, so, you know, th there is a, 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 and we're seeing more and more a higher incidence than previously thought. And the other problem is the symptoms. You know, you have back pain and you have a slip disc and you can point with your finger where that pain goes all the way down the front of your leg into your toes. We, I can tell you and any other neurologist, neurosurgeon can tell you exactly what nerve root's being pinched because it's in a dermatomal distribution. Chiari doesn't really fit like that. Headaches are very subjective. Lots of people have headaches, um, pain syndromes, chronic fatigue, um, memory loss, all of these things kind of get get lumped in. It doesn't mean that Chiari's don't cause those things. It means it's really important to dissect out those symptoms specifically with the imaging and then more importantly listening to and examining the patient. And then um, there's you know a lot of people lump Chiari in. Chiari in the pediatric population, the adult population, um, there are differences. There are clearly similarities but there's also clearly differences. And I think one of the big debates about opening the dura or not opening the dura is born from that. Um, you know, when I, tra I trained in uh, pediatric neurosurgery um, with Lee Sutton at, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we almost never opened up the dura and the kids did just fine. Um, but later uh, in the series, uh, towards the end of his career, he started opening the dura because they start seeing more and more of these kids coming back as adults. Um, with reherniation. So again, is there one treatment for every patient? No, you have to tailor everything uh, uh, to individual patients. Um, and then treatment, you know, who, what patients should be offered surgery? Um, and if so, what treatment? Um, is it a bony decompression alone? Do you do a patch graft? Do you just leave the arachnoid open? Do you do a fusion? Um, if there's a syrinx, what do you do with the syrinx? Do you leave it? Do you watch it? Um, so again, you can talk to 20 different neurosurgeons and you'll probably get um, a lot of variation. Not 20 different answers, but, but enough variation. And now we have to put ourselves in all of you as patients. Uh, that's a really confusing thing when you go to a neurosurgeon who's got you know, a CV the size of a phone book and it's like, this is what you have to do. I'm telling you this is the right thing. And you go get a second opinion and they say the exact same thing. The problem is it's the opposite of what the first surgeon told you. Um, so it becomes a really confusing thing. And then you get on the internet, um, and I, I'm a fan of the internet. I think it's a great thing. You know, patients say, oh, I'm, you know, don't get mad at me. I went on the internet and looked this up. I, no, I think that's wonderful, because then the patients are already coming armed with some un understanding and information. Our job as neurosurgeons is to really explain how what you saw fits or doesn't fit with you. Um, so what constitutes a Chiari? And, and what I'm going to do is I'm not going to give you my opinion. We can talk about you know, that during the open discussion and everybody, you can pick everyone's brains. But um, what I'm going to kind of go over here is, is what we do know, what is at least somewhat data driven. So what constitutes a Chiari? Is it five millimeters of descent of the cerebellar tonsils in adult and we use three millimeters in the child? Is that sole definition of Chiari? Well, if you look at most radiology reports, they will write definition, Chiari malformation, that diagnosis is on there, the primary care sees it, or a neurologist who's treating for headaches sees it, you become diagnosed with the Chiari. Um, are there cases where that's normal? And, and I think most people will tell you yes, and I think the data uh, uh, bears that out. Um, syrinx, do you have a Chiari by definition? Well, syrinx, I'm not going to get into too much into Chiari 1.5 and Chiari 0, there's a whole lecture on that, um, what, so I'm going to kind of leave it to that, but it is, does, is that the definition? Cine flow. How many uh, uh, of you in the audience are familiar with cine flow or flow studies with MRI? Okay, so the minority. So that is something that more and more um, uh, of us are looking at uh, to help. Not to say, there's, and I'm going to show you what that is and what it looks like. You have blockage of flow, you definitely need surgery. To, it, it's another piece of information to help us with an overall decision process. Um, and then symptoms. You know, what are the symptoms that constitute where um, you know, you get that checkbox of, yes, this goes along with it. Why is that important? That's important because if you have five millimeters of cerebellar descent on MRI, you have bad headaches, and you go to your doctor, he refers you to a neurosurgeon, 
that difference of having brain surgery versus not having brain surgery for headaches alone is a really important one. So I'm not sitting here saying that it's inappropriate to do a KRD compression for headaches. What I'm saying is you really have to make sure that you've exhausted every other method and you've got a correct diagnosis. As of today, there are over 150 different diagnoses of headaches. So, you know, it's not the classic, you know, I feel like someone's smashing me in the back of my head with a bat every time I cough, laugh, sneeze. You know, there are variations of Chiari headaches, but there's also a lot of other headaches that can mimic Chiari headaches. Um, so the symptoms are very important. So just as a kind of a, a, a brief overview here, you know, there's a, there's a constellation of, sympt- of, of findings in Chiari. You know, one is hydrocephalus. And um, uh, I think Dr. Dooley pointed out really well that, you know, there is a subset of patients that we see. I personally, if I have a patient with a CSF leak and that happens, you know, sometimes once, but more than twice, by definition, that is hydrocephalus where there's just an increased pressure. It's like a water balloon filling up and it's going the path of least resistance. It's just going to kind of keep popping open that graft. So hydrocephalus um, is definitely concomitant with, with Chiari. And sometimes that's the underlying cause where these ventricles, and they don't necessarily have to be really big. They just all they have to be, especially in younger uh, children and younger adults, is under pressure. And there's a downward pressure and a downward herni- herniation. Um, and then the, you know, the Chiari itself, which is the def- you know, defined as this kind of herniation with com- compression of the brainstem and structures in the frame and magnum, and then a resultant in the latter stages, syrinx, but not always. So this is the constellation. And how these all fit together, what do you treat first? All that, again, this adds to um, you know, the controversy, um, for lack of a better word. So again, does five millimeter of cerebellar descent, does that constitute, by definition, um, a Chiari malformation? And, and I think many would argue no. Um, and, and again, I think... My guess is within the next, you know, five to 10 years, you're going to start hearing Chiari referred, Chiari 1, referred to more and more as a Chiari syndrome, because it really is a syndrome that is constituted by different symptoms, different etiologies, different causes, and and ultimately different treatments. And this is a Cine flow. So this is an MRI, and as you can see, this is a pulsatile phase uh, 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 contrast of of, uh, cerebral spinal fluid um, going uh, 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 anterior and posterior uh, or ventral and dorsal to the spinal cord. So this is a patient, this is a normal patient. You can see the cerebellum's up here. You can see this kind of triangle here. And this is generally what you see filled with neural tissue. Um, and again, if somebody has five millimeters of descent or even six millimeters, and this flow is freely est- flowing, both ventrally and dorsally, we have to ask ourselves, what what are we doing as surgeons? Our goal of surgery is to decompress and to open. So now on the other hand, where I find this is very helpful is if there is blockage. If there is blockage, particularly in patients that come for second opinions that have already had surgeries or have recurrent symptoms, this is very helpful. When there's a recurrence of symptoms, usually the symptoms that recur are exactly what the original symptoms were. And you see blockage of flow. That's a very high... um, prognostic indicator that repeat decompression, um, repeat exploration um, is going to benefit that patient. And again, high indicator. Do we have data? No, we don't. But it it is something that is a new tool that more and more people are using that hopefully will help us, um, you know, kind of answer more questions and and allow us as surgeons to have better guidance. Uh, But it is clearly a useful tool. So again, symptoms. Um, And I want to address this. and, And what I put in this as bullets of controversies are the questions I and my colleagues um, and people that treat care most get off, uh, asked most often. And I can tell you from, I don't know how many years I've been doing this conference, but it's been many and um, really common theme questions, which, which, so I said, you know, th- these are the ones that we're going to, we're going to go after. And some of them are separate to- topics on their own. So I won't get too much into, but you know, symptoms are, are, are a big deal because, you know, headache, Valsalva, you're bearing down, you get a, bad pressure in the back of your head, headache, neck pain. Okay, that's classic. That, that, there's not too much controversy with that. Neck pain, hearing or balance problems, muscle weakness, particularly in the hands. Um, 
dizziness, tinnitus or ringing in the ears, um, which, which there's, there's a clear correlation with, um, problems with hand coordination, fine motor skills. That's generally what we start to see earlier is the, the uh, um, fine motor uh, uh, movement. And, and patients will often talk about not being able to open jars, dropping things, hands getting fatigued, um, and then difficulty swallowing uh, from the 11th cranial nerve. So those are pretty common. So when you start hearing those things, you see the MRI. Well, what about what a lot of Chiari patients suffer from, which I, th I think, you know, and, and I'm not proud to say it, but I, I think a lot of, of um, physicians kind of blow off. You know, it's, it's the patient population, um, and it happens, and data does support this. You have a young female coming in, and there's a real quick, and, and from both male and female providers, that, well, you know what, you're under stress, it's, it's anxiety, it's this, it's that, you're being histrionic. Um, but there's enough patients, and if you treat Chiari enough, you see that patients complain of fatigue. They complain consistently of a brain fog or memory loss. Not all of them, but it's clear. And up until recently, there really wasn't a correlation. And so it was, well, you know what? There's nothing that we know of. The cerebellum is for balance. It's for coordination. has nothing to do with that. So let's just forget that. Talk to your primary care doctor. Well, there's more and more evidence, and, and really thanks to imaging, particularly functional imaging, um, we have a much, much better understanding. And there's something called the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome that was described probably in the, the mid-90s, but really wasn't correlated to this. It was, we saw this in patients that had strokes in the back part of the brain, the cerebellum, particularly media, uh, uh, medially, um, in a, a blood vessel called pica, um, trauma, things like that. And with functional MRI, we started to really understand better the pathways in the cerebellum, which I'll show you. So there is a correlation. There's no question at all there's a correlation. Now, is that for every patient? No. Are there other factors? Absolutely. So misdiagnosis and poor communication worsen. When you're on your third surge and everyone's telling you a different answer, people aren't listening to what your symptoms are. They're not listening to, um, you know, what um, you're telling them. Frustration starts to, to, to mimic a lot of these things, not, not mimic, but will give you some of these symptoms. Um, so education, understanding reduces and relieves us, just basically listening. I mean, the, the, the simple fact of just sitting and listening to a patient is, it's one of the simplest things that we've got away from. Um, I banned, uh, seven years ago, I banned computers from all of our, we have a pretty big group of neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuropsychologists. We do not have computers in our exam rooms. So think about the, and this goes for us too. You know, believe it or not, doctors go to doctors um, and our families go to doctors. And you've all been there, right? Think about the last time you went to your doctor's office. It's the first thing that happened. After the fourth person came in, right? The medical student came in, the resident came in, the fellow came in, or a, a APP came in, and then the doc comes in, asks you the same questions over again. I mean, like, so how many times do you have to answer, you know, the same, same questions? Well, what happens? This is what happens, right? back towards you, tapping away at, at a, um, a computer, that's a real problem, particularly for this type of a, a, a process and, and syndrome, Chiari, where you really need to kind of see the affect, see, pay, look at family members that are in the room too. So, you know, putting all this together, yes, there are other reasons besides Chiari, but we do know that the cerebellum has, um, uh, particularly medially in the dente nucleus, uh, executive function, emotion, language, um, not just motor and spatial, and working memory. And we're seeing this more and more and more. Um, and if you take functional MRI, which is what this is, and you give patients tasks, you can actually see the areas of the brain lighting up that don't, you don't traditionally think of the cerebellum performing. So, you know, memory is, is clearly a role. Um, there's clearly a role. And I think what we need to do, getting back to my first slides, we need to do a better job of doing pre and post operative neuropsychological testing so we can see. And there have been some really good studies done actually showing a difference, particularly with patients that have been um, correlated to memory being uh, the resultant um, of, of a Chiari, and particularly the patients with severe Chiaris where you saw a picture in the earlier talk of that big fourth ventricle, and you can literally see the brainstem being pulled down. So that, that is pulling on the medial aspect of the vermis and the medial part of the cerebellum, and that, that's where these areas are. So, um, you know, so the next time someone tells you that memory and this and that has nothing to do with it, um, you know, you can tell them you saw a slide and they're wrong. Um, and the other thing is the, you know, we can go to the other extreme. 
Um, I don't know how many of you were aware, but there was a big, big uh, movement years ago about doing Chiari surgery for chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and you know, it was one of the very few things that the American Association of Neurologic Surgeons actually came out with a mission statement. Um, again, because there was no data. And then you got, you know, I, I, I think it's easy to say, oh, you know, surgeons just want to operate. I think most surgeons want to, as surgeons, there's nothing more gratifying than doing something immediately and getting an immediate re a benefit for your patient. Where somebody's coming in, they're suffering, you come out of an operating room and their symptoms are gone. There's nothing better. Um, and sometimes you can get blinded by thinking, well, chronic fatigue syndrome, we can put this together and the symptoms don't really fit. Um, so you have, to, you have to understand, you know, there has to be some basis for what you're doing. So pregnancy, I'm not going to get too much into this. Another big controversy, which I don't think is as much of a controversy now as it was when I was much younger. Um, you know, we used to battle with the OBGYNs. Um, and, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of women undergo C-sections unnecessarily because it's just nobody wants the liability. Um, but, I, but I do think we have some good, better guidance now. And, and uh, Cormac uh, is going to be talking about this tomorrow, so I'm not going to get too much into it. But where in pregnancy you get Valsalva where you're bearing down, what, what happens um, when you do that? Well, the back part of the brain is where all the sinuses are. So these are big, big, big venous sinuses in the back part of the skull, the transverse, sigmoid, straight sinus. And when you do that, they engorge. And when they engorge, where do they engorge? They engorge right here where you already have a Chiari compression and it increases. And that CF, CSF becomes blocked. That's actually the etiology most likely of those posterior headaches as well. So the fear is that while you're pushing during a pregnancy and you're doing these constant valsalvas that can be quite long and quite severe, that you can further worsen and have a catastrophic event. The data really doesn't pan that out. Um, there, there's very, very few instances of, of permanent. There may be some transient, um, but permanent neurologic deficits in patients with Chiari. Um, so the, the general census is that, if, in my practice is, um, and you know, again, data supporting it, that asymptomatic patients that have a Chiari, I will let them get, I will, I will write a letter saying they can have whatever type of delivery they want. Um, now, what about a syrinx? That, that, there isn't a lot of data there, and I individualize that to patients. Um, and um, if they're truly asymptomatic, I'm hard-pressed to tell them they can't have a vaginal delivery. Um, symptomatic, truly symptomatic patients, um, I do recommend that. Um, I, I can think of once in my entire career where we did a surgery um, on a pregnant woman before uh, she delivered because she was just deteriorating um, uh, uh, very acutely. So it wasn't really so much for the delivery. But then after that, that's the other clear point to make clear. Once you have a patient has a decompression done, they anatomically do not have a Chiari. So therefore, the restrictions you had before, you no longer have. Um, whether it's playing sports, vaginal delivery, because there's, there's no more fear of that herniation because that area is, is decompressed and opened. So that gets into return to sports. Another thing where a lot of these, these kids are deprived of, um, you know, playing organized sports throughout their entire childhood, um, adulthood. Um, some people have scholarships to college. Uh, not, uh, um, you know, I've had many patients who, you know, their, their scholarship is contingent on them being able to be cleared to play, you know, whether it's football, hockey, um, and even baseball. So again, based on data, um, and there's a recent paper, a um, uh, really good paper, um, that again, asymptomatic or uh, uh, treated Chiaris can return uh, with education. The only thing that some of the papers lean uh, towards a trend is that if in fact you have a Chiari and you have a concussion, that post-concussive syndrome may be more severe and longer. Um, but as far as any type of serious uh, adverse offense like quadriplegia, paraplegia um, is, is extremely, extremely, extremely rare. Um, and if patients, again, like, much like uh, um, pregnancy, symptomatic, syrinx, avoid contact sports. And you can't lump sports into sports. There's different types of sports. You know, playing um, uh, football, wrestling, those are things where you're going to have re re repeated trauma to the head and the cranial cervical axis, period. It's just part of the sport. So, again, you have to really um, measure that. Um, so, dura, to open or not to open, um, 
you know, this is a big, 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 big discussion. I'm going to leave a lot of this for the, the, the discussion. And again, there's very strong opinions about this. Uh, for those of you that are at the Philadelphia one, there's a, a whole really great heated dialogue about shrinking the tonsils or not. And, you know, do you do it in pediatrics and we do it in adults and it's different. So the data on this has actually gotten um, much better. Um, and there's a paper that's at like three months old um, that is a, a consortium of many, many pediatric neurosurgeons throughout the country, and, and many of the speakers here uh, uh, have that. I'm an adult uh, uh, carry neurosurgeon, um, but that showed that the um, recurrence, and th this has been borne out in other papers as well. If your dura, if you have your dura opened, and most of them do have uh, 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 some form of uh, tonsillar shrinkage, and we'll talk a little bit about that, your risk of recurrence is lower. The risk that you're going to come back and have to go back to surgery and then have your dura open is lower. However, there is a clear um, increased uh, a complication rate, in, particularly within the first six months. And the two most common are a uh, aseptic meningitis, a chemical meningitis, and um, pseudomeningocele. But many of the pseudomeningocele's are radiographic and not symptomatic and didn't need to be treated, but a subset did. So I think the take-home message here is everything is a risk and a benefit. What we don't know is does every patient need to have their dura open? Are there some patients with certain symptoms that do better with just a bony decompression without the, the risk? And I will tell you that more and more surgeons are looking at minimal um, bony openings. Um, endoscopic is now um, starting to gain traction. And to be really clear about the, the tonsillar syringes, this is another thing where confusion comes into play. We're not cutting the tonsils out, and some people do that. That's a very different thing to cut versus shrink. When you're shrinking the tonsils, you're taking cautery with little bipolars, and you're literally touching the tissue, putting heat on it, and it shrivels up, and you're done. It's a very different proposition than cutting things where there's blood and there is going to be scar tissue. Um, Patch graft, again, there's a lot of discussion on this. Do you use bovine pericardium? Do you use just the arachnoid? This lower picture here is the arachnoid where we open the dura, but we leave the arachnoid intact. Easier said than done. It's very easy. It's very translucent and thin. You get a puncture there, you're going to get a CSF leak, but, but many surgeons do this effectively. Bovine pericardium, um, synthetic collagen base, layover, suture in. Um, there's really no one clear, uh, one being better than the other. Um, and then we're going to, I'm, I'm going to, again, I want to get into, you know, who. So it's pretty interesting. Aetna, one of the big, biggest insurance carriers, they have guidelines of telling the surgeons and their clients, if you, you will not be reimbursed for this surgery or approved for the surgery unless you have these symptoms. So this is Aetna. This isn't doctors. This isn't data. This is Aetna. So it says that basically um, they will consider... Uh, if the Chiari mouth, so first of all, type two, three, and four, there's no question. They'll pay for that. But type one, because of all this controversy, um, that if you have cerebellar tonsils greater than five in adult or three in children, and at least one of the following, um, signs and symptoms that are related to the Chiari, all reasonable sources and signs and symptoms have been ruled out. Symptoms are isolated to head, neck, conservative treatment should be directed by a neurologist, sleep apnea, they won't do it. So there's a whole, whole list here. So when you start getting the payers involved, it, 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 it tells you that there's real controversy. And, you know, lastly, I'm just going to close with not all Chiaris are the same. You can't just say, you have a Chiari, this is a treatment. The Chiari on the left, which is five millimeters and asymptomatic, yeah, technically it's a Chiari. It's a very different than the one on the right, where there's about almost 20 millimeters of, of descent, complete blockage of, of CSF. Um, and I will tell you, those symptoms don't correlate. I, these two patients, um, I have in another talk, that one on the left with five millimeters is grossly symptomatic and did remarkably well after surgery. This is a patient of mine that refuses surgery. She's 70 now. She didn't want surgery. Um, and she was right. I, I got, this was a long time. I've been following her for over 15 years now. She basically didn't have real strong symptoms, but I got kind of carried away with like, wow, look how bad that is. And, you know, sometimes she would have problems opening a jar. She's done just fine. I saw her last week in the office. I see her every year. She brings me uh, uh, cookies. Um, so you can't correlate that with symptoms uh, by any means. And the goals of the surgery are really, the focus is whatever choice you go, open dura, closed dura, dural patch graft, arachnoid, the goal is to decompress, open that frame and magnum, and restore the CSF flow.
If those things are not done, there is not, you're, you're not achieving what you need to achieve uh, in the surgery. And you know, alternatives, I'm gonna um, segue this into our next speaker, um, uh, Dave Knowlton, who's been a champion of medical marijuana for Chiari. Um, we're doing a study now through ASAP um, and the Siri. Uh, uh, organization to look at medical marijuana for, for pain, specifically in Chiari, and it's pretty compelling. Acupuncture, physical therapy, headache management, these all help. These are the things that you have to address uh, uh, before you go right to surgery, especially in patients that don't have clear-cut symptoms. So in conclusion, there's really evidence, certainly level one evidence, lacking for clear data-driven uh, uh, recommendations. Chiari's not a uniform disease. I think we need to start thinking about it as a syndrome. And each patient should be individualized, and there's no one protocol for everybody that has a Chiari. And the importance of organizations like ASAP is critically important because this is where we can pool data together. And what we need all of you to do is to push us to do a better job so that we can come up with better answers. Thank you.